Harvard Divinity School. The Planet You Inherit, book event, April 20th, 2023. Welcome to um, this book talk on The Planet You Inherit by my beloved mentor, Larry Rasmussen. I'm Diane Moore, and I am the faculty director of religion and public life here at Harvard Divinity School, and my colleagues and I are so honored to sponsor this important book talk, uh, both for the power of this particular volume, but also for uh, what it represents um, in terms of one particular life long lived, devoted to these questions well ahead of the curve before many of us caught up. Um, I also just want to take a moment before I do introductions to thank my colleagues, Natalie Campbell, who is responsible for the beautiful publicity and any information that found you all to find your way here. You can thank Natalie for that. To, uh, yes, thank you, really. <laughs> um, to Judy Beals and to Reem Atassi, my Reem just, Reem right here. Um, <laughs> for uh, all the background work. There is always so much that goes into these events that um, is hard to see, but to know that if it goes well with wonderful food, with a beautiful space, with um, clarity of timings, it's because of this, these two beloved colleagues. So I also want to thank um, my wonderful colleagues on the panel. John, it's great to have you with us and look forward to hearing your wise voice. Thank you so much for being here. And my two special thanks to my uh, dear friend, Terry Tempest Williams, who uh, is um, responsible for reuniting me with my <laughs> beloved uh, mentor, Larry Rasmussen, after 30 years. Uh -huh. and, and, and his wife and partner, Nyla, to thank you, Nyla and Larry, for traveling to be here with us. Mm for the honor of having you with us. And finally, Larry, uh, for, to you for writing this beautiful book um, that brings us here today. So our timeline today will be that um, I will give a few more introductions, formal introductions to, to our wonderful panelists, and then I will read a short poem, and Larry then will take the podium for a 20 to 30 minute uh, introduction to the book for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it so you'll get a feel for what is present here and his motivation for writing it. Um, and then all three of us will take turns responding briefly, beginning with John to the book and then offer Larry one or two questions to respond to. Uh, and then we will open it up for audience questions for at least the last 20 minutes. So. Uh, we will definitely have time for that, so please take note if you have questions along the way. So John Gaiman is a member of the Council of Student Sustainability Leaders and a first-year Master of Theological Studies student here at Harvard Divinity School. He's concentrating in the philosophy of religion and studies the topics of body, trauma, and healing in the context of colonialism, racism, and white supremacy. He considers these issues through the lenses of phenomenology, psychoanalysis, and decolonial studies. On the council, John's interested in exploring the relationship between sustainability, racial justice, mm. and healing. Terry Tempest Williams joined HDS as a writer in residence for the 2017-18 academic year and is continuing thankfully to us, until June 30th of 2025. And at that point, we will try to have her stay for another 10 years. That's the plan. <laughs> she is the recipient of numerous awards and numerous, and the writer of numerous books, including the environmental classic Refuge and Unnatural History of Family and Place, published in 1991, Finding Beauty in a Broken World, published in 2008, and is the title of her very popular seminar, that mm. writing seminar that she teaches here at Harvard Divinity School. The Hour of Land, a personal topography of America's national parks, which was published in June 2016, which coincided with the, um, and to honor the centennial of the National Park Service. Erosion, Essays of Undoing, published in 2017. And The Moon is Behind Us, with mm. her friend and uh, photographer, Faisal Sheikh, 
which was just published in 2021. Her writing has also appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Orion Magazine, and numerous anthologies worldwide. Terry is a crucial voice, an inspiring voice for ecological consciousness and social change, and yet another pioneer in this work. And Larry Rasmussen. Larry is, is the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor Emeritus of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. His book, Earth Honoring Faith, Religious Ethics in a New Key, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2013, received the Nautilus Gold Prize for Ecology, Environment, and the Nautilus Grand Prize for the best 2014 book overall out of 27 categories. An earlier volume, Earth Community, Earth Ethics, published by Mary Knoll Books in 1996, won the prestigious, how do you pronounce this? <laughs> I, I'm yeah. sorry, I should have checked this out and put this, you know. Right. Gra Grav Gravemeyer. Gravemeyer, that's WSV, Gravemeyer uh, Award. I stumble hmm. over it every time and I just, just give up and be humble in what I just did. So <laughs> Gravemeyer Award, which is a prestigious award even if no one can pronounce it, <laughs> in religion in 1997. A volume written with Bruce Birch hmm. um, and Cynthia Mo Lobeda and Jacqueline Lapsley, uh, entitled Bible, Bible and Ethics, A New Conversation, appeared in 2018. Larry served as a member of the Science, Ethics, and Religion Advisory Committee of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I want to highlight that mm. because it is rare for a religious studies scholar to be able to uh, gain the kind of um, respect that Larry was able to gain to hold this position in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and, I, and I think that's just another commentary on his important, his important voice. He was also a recipient of the Henry Luce uh, Fellowship in Theology, uh, the Fellman Award for Distinguished Christian Ministries in Higher Education, the Joseph Sittler Award for Outstanding Leadership in Theological Education, and the UNITAS uh, Award uh, from Union Theological Seminary awarded to distinguished alumnus, as a distinguished alumnus. In 2021, he was granted the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society of Christian Ethics. So to me, Larry was my mentor, one of two beloved mentors at my time when I pursued a doctorate at uh, Union Theological Seminary. And there are many things that I learned from Larry. Um, I learned rigor. I learned what it means to be committed to a cause and a vision for the long haul both by his own writing and by his own experience and his embodiment of these values. Um, I learned uh, how to enjoy humor. He is wickedly funny. I don't know <laughs> if that'll come out here, but he is very funny. Uh, and that laughter um, was an important um, uh, balm, if you will, through the rigors of a doctoral program. But the thing that I come away from and that Larry cultivated with his beloved wife, Nyla, was a home and a presence of profound warmth and generosity, acceptance, and kindness consistently. So with that, as a tribute to you, Larry, and your impact not just on me, but to all who I know have crossed your beautiful home and had the privilege of learning from you in your classrooms. I'd like to share the poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, Kindness. Mm -hmm. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. 
Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. Hmm. Book, Larry's work, his joy, his kindness, his love is not born of superficiality. It is born of deep confrontation with the challenges of the world and the incredible opportunities and beauty that it also yields. So with that, Larry, I'll turn it over to you. Hmm. May I borrow a copy of that beautiful book? Of <laughs> I forgot to bring mine up here. So I'll, I'll, I'll use it here. Uh, I'll use the book, just the book. Yeah, yeah. I'm, after that poem of kindness, we could just say class dismissed. It was a beautiful way to, <laughs> to start the day. But Nyla and I are having such a good time at this little love feast. We came yesterday, and it's just been pure pleasure and joy since. So thanks uh, from both of us, especially to Diane and Terry and John and Judy and Reem and Natalie uh, for all that you've done uh, for this event. Now, Diane suggested that I say how the letters <clears throat> and the book came about and speak to some of the, some of the themes. First of all, I'm going to say how good it is to be safe here at Harvard. Our, our uh, daughter-in-law, Lena Vijegas, is from Colombia, and she was explaining to the two boys who are the recipients of the letters that we were coming to New York. And Lena speaks beautiful, fluent English, but once in a while, she'll uh, give a Spanish twist to an English word. And she said, you know, grandma and grandpa are coming and grandpas, they're gonna be at Harvard and then grandpa's going to jail. <laughs> and it was <clears throat> Eduardo, eight year old said, grandpa's going to jail? Uh, Yale. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow I go to jail. I'm glad to be safe here <clears throat> at Harvard today. <laughs> I started writing the letters in 2018, and they continued into COVID until April uh, of 2021. Uh, the book was never in view. A book was never in view, only a sheaf of letters that I was going to pass on. But when a book offer came, uh, I was very pleased with the audience, millennials and Generation Z that the publisher has in mind. But they said it couldn't be more than 200 pages. They don't read books more than 200 pages. <laughs> they haven't consulted with our grandson who is on his second round at age eight with all the Harry Potter books. <laughs> but uh, I, so I haven't been writing because I've been attending to selecting uh, letters and editing them. Uh, but I'll start again, and when I do, um, I'll take up one of the big topics that isn't in the book. There are, most of the letters are big topics. I mean, this is a time when humans are, for the first time, the creators of a geological epoch, and not just a historical <coughs> era. Uh, global warming, climate volatility, ecosystem <coughs> uncertainty, biodiversity loss, mass extinction, the nature of human nature uh, itself, and what we can and can't count on as uh, homo sapiens. Who and where is God in the Anthropocene? Letters about a spirituality for a time such as this, 
how the boys and we might become good ancestors, etc. Those are all big topics. But the one that isn't there is a letter on mortality. And uh, Martin, whom I call Spud, uh, was asking his mother, he's four, pressing five, <clears throat> Mom, are you going to die? And Lena said, yes, but not for a very long time. Can I die with you? And <laughs> Lena said, oh, how sweet. And then he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, when you die, can I have your watch? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about willing him my watch so that he isn't sitting around waiting for his dad to die at a young age. Um, so the, uh, the letter's gravity, and there's lots of it, is matched with stories and humor like Martin's. Um, and maybe you'll recognize the human condition and be amused. Humor, after all, shares the same root as humble and human, namely the root of humus. All are from fertile topsoil. Now Luther calls us clods. <laughs> but he says the clods became the cultivators and, they, and developed culture and cultus, which is worship. Cultus is the root there. Uh, so you've got humus, soil, land, and cultus, worship. It captures a good bit of our humanity in these letters. But the letters came about because of age. Our age, Nyla and I are octogenarians, and the boys' age. Grandsons are, who are only eight, and almost five. The kids are in their tender years, while Nyla and I are living in the autumn and the winter of our lives. And because we will not see them come of age, we wanted to leave them with more than just a few wispy memories. Thus, some sharing of our lives as we look through our eyes at what they face. <clears throat> the boys are our biological grandkids, but there are five other grandkids in the on the dedicatory page. Uh, these are our bonus grandkids who call us grandma and grandpa, in most cases because one or the other of their parents before they became their parents lived with us. Uh, while going to school. I was thrilled when Terry Tempest Williams said she'd write the foreword. In fact, I tried to convince Broadleaf Books to put her name in very big letters on the cover and mine in small. And then people would buy it thinking it were one of Terry's books and when they got home and discovered I, uh, otherwise they might not bring it back. So. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. I'll, let me speak to a couple themes in the book. I draw on James Baldwin often. I reread Baldwin uh, during COVID. <clears throat> and I try to be as radically honest as he is. Not everything that is faced can be changed, Baldwin writes. But nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I'm hoping that that kind of radical realism about our planetary plight inhabits these pages. So that's one theme. The second theme is wonder. The two meet in a Sabbath prayer from Reformed Judaism that I discovered too late for the book. But it captures much of what is there. Here's the prayer. Days pass and the years vanish, and we walk sightless among miracles. Lord, fill our eyes with seeing and our minds with knowing. Let there be moments when your presence, like lightning, illumines the darkness in which we walk. Help us to see wherever we gaze that the bush burns unconsumed 
And we, clay, touched by God, will reach out for holiness and exclaim in wonder, how filled with awe is this place? And we did not know it. The very first letter to three-year-old Eduardo includes this. What I most want for you and the little brother you say is swimming in your mommy's tummy is that you let yourself be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by wonder, and lose yourself in the kaleidoscope of creation, not to escape the harsh world, but better to inhabit it. Wondering is a way of experiencing truth. Of course you should follow science fiercely. Tested expertise is indispensable. Yet rational analysis can miss the most essential things in life, which are bonds of love and belonging. And they are most at home in the wonder and awe that lead to knowing deeper and caring more. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, finish the remarks with three uh, excerpts. The first is the author's note. Uh, it, while it doesn't really give you the tone and timber of the letters or the humor in the stories, it does set the framework for the book. I knew my grandchildren confronted the har harrowing challenge of moving from industrial to ecological civilization. The Great Transition, it's called, Epic Times. I was ready for that, but my pen was startled to discover a truth that has taken us by stealth. For the first time ever, humanity has become a geologic force. We've slid off the back end of one geologic epoch, the Holocene, onto the front end of another, the Anthropocene, the age of the human. Thus, we face epoch times as well as epic times and a further daunting transition. These transitions are the great work, as Thomas Berry's phrase, that awaits my grandchildren though they were never asked and didn't get a vote, remapping and remaking the world amid uncertainty is their calling, as it is ours. Although the, uh, their world cannot be ours and shouldn't be, I wanted to step away from an academic career teaching social ethics and just write love letters. Mm -hmm. Love letters that face what they face on a changed and changing planet. I'm certain the letters are urgent, not because the kids' grandparents are frail, but because their world is. Um, so let me then fill that framework out with a few pages of a letter, one of three on the changed nature of human responsibility. This one, there are three letters on re human responsibility. This is the second. The first one is the kindness of microbial strangers <laughs> and our responsibility for the bacteria and microbes that <clears throat> without which we don't live a minute. Um, and then the second letter is responsible by degrees. And then the third one is called, it's all in the pronouns. Um, so here's uh, a few lines from uh, responsible by degrees. <clears throat> dear Martin, dear Eduardo, August 18th, 2020. I had imagined these letters as a cascade of stories a few reflection on our lives and yours, and some humor. Instead, they turned somber as I tried to say how your years look for the planet you inherit. 
That has shoved certain questions front and center, landing there because your lives and ours are home to different epochs. In several letters, the lead question has been the difference it makes if the human condition is the same or not. Does it matter that you are Anthropocene kids and Grandma Nyla and I are Holocene kids? If so, how? We'll eventually finish this line of questioning, don't give up hope, by outlining what's most important for you and everyone else, renewed human responsibility. What makes another look necessary is that we now wield powers once reserved for the gods. As Stuart Brand put it in 1968, we are go as gods and might as well get good at it. Later, he became more emphatic. We are as gods and have to get good at it. Homo Deus, the god species, is who we've become. We're named as such by big history writers like Yuval Noah Harari, who says that until recently, evolution has followed the unchanging principles of natural selection. Now, however, humankind, I'm quoting him, is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design, end quote. Intelligent? Maybe in the future. But so far, design has been too happenstance and without conscious shared intention. Planetary ecosystems are, quote, managed, end quote, more as a consequence of an assumed way of life and powerful technologies than deliberation. That's more accident than design, and not very intelligent. Bio biologist E.O. Wilson is even more skeptical. Quote, we are not as gods. We're not yet sentient or intelligent enough to be much of anything, <laughs> end quote. Spud, do you remember Richard Leakey's remarks that we're the only species he knows that consistently makes bad decisions? <laughs> But Harare is correct that our powers do take the evolutionary process beyond natural selection. And any account of responsibility is truthful only if it confronts our powers on this novel scale, in these novel ways. Assisted evolution is the going term for what we're doing. But it's deceptive because it hides the depth and breadth of the evolutionary changes we're affecting. Would you have guessed from assisted evolution that our extra carbon would remake the world, alter marine chem chemistry, flood coastlines, strip glaciers to bare bones, embolden deserts, warp the circulation of ocean currents, supercharge extreme weather events, and rearrange the distribution of animal, plant, and microbial species across the globe. Would you have guessed <clears throat> that every major taxonomic group, animals, insects, plants, fungi, and microorganism, is being driven down new evolutionary paths by human-assisted changes? Assisted evolution is room temperature talk that doesn't begin to reveal what we've done. We've created no analog climates, no analog ecosystems, a whole no analog future. Hijacked and hacked evolution would be more honest. The stakes of a human-dominated no analog world are stark. If Homo dominatus, Holocene status, has become Homo Deus, Anthropocene reality, does the iron rule of empires, namely, they fall, hold for Earth as human empire? The reality is that modernity's dream, exercising mastery over unruly nature, failed. Instead, we bound ourselves faithfully to Earth as a single wild, evolving force. There is no outside for us or Archimedean point 
There never was. There was only more room for error and weaker powers. Nature has always included us. It's rather ironic, isn't it, that just when we realize we're major players in a no analog world, we discover we're a lot less important than we thought. Wild Earth can get along fine without us. For most of its life, it has. I'll, I'll stop there and uh, invite you to pursue responsibility <laughs> for, for that. OK, here's, here's, the, here's the final letter, um, albeit much, much abridged. Um, it's entitled, Leaving a Legacy. Uh, dear Eduardo, dear Martin, these are love letters from first to last. And the very first one, love bridges geologic epochs. Spud hadn't made his grand entrance yet, so that letter's only to you, Eduardo. But you told us he was on his way, swimming in mommy's tummy. This one, to both of you, will end the same with love bridging from our world to yours. Despite that love, or because of it, writing has been wrenching at times. Why should you two be saddled with a global civilizational challenge amid a geological shift in a no analog world? <laughs> Unexpected crises made the letters difficult and deep enough <clears throat> uh, that the planet's physical tumult and social chaos began to feel like the loss of worlds that African and indigenous peoples have long experienced. Somehow, they had to survive loss of their civilizations and land, and only to begin on alien terrain. While the world did not end, some worlds did, their worlds did. Now that's reality for more than the colonized. The outcome is a stack of uncharted challenges and the need for a different great work. If there's a humorous version, it's Pogo's. You know, Pogo the cartoon character. Quote, what we face, friends, are insurmountable opportunities. <laughs> What's the rigging for insurmountable opportunities? It includes radical honesty. The early Anthropocene is already baked in to such an extent that your world simply will not escape. Immense suffering, together with displaced peoples, flora, and fauna. Not, nor will compromise and defeat be avoided. Wild cards guarantee uncertainty as the one sure thing. Big, complex, interacting systems determining futures you cannot control will ratchet up risk, frustrate, frustrate the best of intentions, and assure failures. Life always dishes up more than we can plan for, some of which will turn out to be wonderfully good. But much will not. In any case, all of it mandates radical realism. And I quote Baldwin as I quoted him earlier. This takes a toll. And the toll is greater, not less, when remaking the world is your calling and you love what you're doing. That's love's cruel side. Pain, loss, and responsibility are more poignant when you care. Don't push away the pain, accept it. It's not there by accident, it's a life imperative. On the other side is healing and new resolve. President Barack and Michelle Obama were in Oslo in 2009 to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. The president was coming off a very difficult time in the White House agonizing over ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, he would return to 
that and much more, not least an impasse on health care legislation and the Great Recession. As the Obamas were about to leave the hotel for the Nobel dinner, one of the American delegates knocked on the door and told them to look out the window. They opened the drapes and there were several thousand people, each holding a candle, the traditional ritual for the city to salute the Peace Prize recipient. When the Obamas appeared, the crowd cheered wildly. Here, amid the president's preoccupations with agonies that wouldn't pause, was a pool of stars held aloft by those who refused to give up on the idea that the world could be better. President Obama's response to himself was, whatever you do won't be enough, I heard the voices say. Try anyway. Obama did not achieve everything he wanted to. Oddly, failure while trying anyway is a fine criterion. If what you want to do with your tombstone dash, the dash on your tombstone between your birth date and your death date, if what you want to do with your tombstone dash isn't big enough to risk failures in multiple tries, some of which will fail, then your vision and your goal are too humble, too shallow, too unworthy of your one wild and precious life. So accept the wisdom that because remapping and remaking is civilizational work in a no analog world, whatever you do will not be enough. It cannot be. If nothing else, your lives, however long, will not be long enough. You belong to a vital transitional generation, but that's not the generation that slaps the final coat of paint on the wall or gets to spit polish the shoes for the victory dance. Do you recall my response to Niebuhr and Baldwin about race reckoning that it still needed a century? My generation's idealism was dashed by that prospect, but the two of them waded in with renewed energy. To them, a century of good work for undoing legacies as deep as race and caste seemed hopeful and realistic. So take your first steps and make your way, knowing that others will add more cairns. The stones will keep talking. Still, my generation's impatience was right in one way. It's vital to dream an ideal world and go big with confidence. Especially the young often get things done because they didn't know they couldn't. Impossible gets nudged into the possible column. So dream a world and lace it with a little utopia. That's a world that levels the standard of living with a steady state economy attentive to Earth's regeneration. A world of jobs and health care for all in need of them. A world where quality of life for household and community is the economy's purpose and focus, not the profits of big firms and corporations. A world of widespread public transportation in and between green cities, a world of clean renewable energy sources, a world of diets low in the use of animals, a world where spiritual well-being replaces gaudy consumerism, a world where diversity plays out as strength, not inequity, and where colonialist and environmental debt is settled with reparations on the way to liberty and justice for all. A world attentive to the whole community of life and its glory, with sapiens present neither as devils nor divines, but the world's true wonder. That's Maya Angelou. And not least, a world full of music. Well, music can't cure everything, with it, you can sing down the grimness in front of you. Add your dreams to these with Dr. King's beloved community in view and Amanda Gorman in your ears. Amanda Gorman. One thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, 
then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. Yours is certainly not a moment for action, caution, toss it, and resist the advice of conservatives who say, never try anything the first time around. It's fine to start small and to get help. In the raised bed on your deck, I've seen you sow seeds as tiny as the little black poppy seeds on your favorite bagel. Next, you tend the fresh green shoots, and then you do some weeding. That's only a start, I know, but it's enough. It's enough in that it's a microcosm of the future, as little, so big. And it's enough in that you're joining multitudes of great workers who, taking responsibility for their own seed beds, join you. A word to Benjamin from a canticle for uh, Leibowitz could go on your wall. Quote, to sense your responsibility is wisdom, Benjamin. To think that you can carry it alone is folly. You need not, cannot carry it alone, and you shouldn't try. But action is indispensable. To take action is the antidote to Anthropocene anxiety, anxiety that otherwise slips into depression. Through it all, don't forget the paradox you are. Our past shortcomings and mistakes, some of them doozies, are real. Blemished is who we are, and you will be too. Yet magnificence is yours as well. Grandma Nyla's favorite poem has it right. Oh God, help me to believe the truth about myself, no matter how beautiful it is. We can tell you how beautiful it is. Spud was in his crib, supposedly on his way to sleep, but jabbering on, now with the complete sentences, that come when a two-year-old is ambling toward three. Your dad was nearby, but Martine was in his own world and said to no one in particular, I love Grandpa so much. We should all believe such unsolicited truth about ourselves, no matter how beautiful it is. And on our better days, we do. You've heard me say that my worldview is one of tragedy. Yet life with Nyla is graced at every turn, and never have I felt so much gratitude or satisfaction as I do now. Tragedy sits alongside a deeply felt conviction that the existence of the universe is utterly astonishing, with life a miracle. I love Emily Dickinson's line, to live is so startling, it leaves little time for everything else. <laughs> Life's miracle and mystery brings serenity and surprise. Thus does my tragic view partner with a somewhat unexpected giddy love of life, or rather a giddy love of unexpected life. Is it different for you? I close with a rabbi and then add to grandma's poem, a favorite of mine, and some wisdom from earlier. Love gets the last word all around. The old rabbi says, I am dust and ashes. He also says, the world was made for me. So humble are we and so magnificent. See if you, what your friends say if you put we are dust and ashes on your backpacks. Right above, the world was made for me. I've cited a favorite poem often, but never have I felt its force the way I feel it now. It's from Denise Levertov's collection, Candles in Babylon. Earlier, I wrote that we are now both the ark and the flood the exiled and the exilers. Babylon is where we've exiled ourselves. Babylon is us. But Levertov's poem itself is beginners. How apt is that? 
for remappers and remakers. The poet's words, like the prophets, are for you. Note the use of love, imagine, hope, justice, and mercy in the very first lines. They rise to the top like heavy cream for such a time as this. Beginners, but we have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How could we tire of hope? So much is in bud. How can desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Only begun to envision how it might be to live as siblings with beast and flower, not as oppressors. Surely our river cannot be hastening into the sea of non-being. Surely it cannot drag in the silt all that is innocent. Not yet. Not yet. There is too much broken that must be mended, too much hurt that we have done to each other that cannot yet be forgiven. We have only begun to know the power that is in us if we would join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in bud. Add Niebuhr's wisdom to Levertov's inspiration with this preface. Your worst tragedy as beginners would be to have no sense of tragedy. Lacking its realism and lacking action, you will fall into despair. Grab hold of the saving alternative, namely fragments that reflect the whole. Here are Niebuhr's. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. Above all, keep saying yes to life in spite of everything. And I love you so much. And don't forget the birds or your carrots. With hovering love, Grandpa and Grandma. P.S. I have a request. If by the time you read this as a young as young men, I am dead, as dead I well may be, would you two join your mother's lovely voice, maybe your dad's too, at my memorial service? And would you sing not just any song, rather this one, where your living and my dying meet in a love that casts out fear and is stronger than death. It even bridges geological epochs. The first stanza is in, well, the stanza is in Spanish, and then the English is, in all our living, we belong to God. And in our dying, we are still with God. So whether living or whether dying, we belong to God. We belong to God. Thank you. Um, I have cards if anyone is interested, information about the book and the website that asks you to write some letters of your own and submit them if you'd like. We're going to have a little conversation among us and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, did I go too, too long? Larry, thank you very much for the book. Um, I hear it as a prayer, especially <laughs> for my generation. And I want to offer a question that I often think about. What does it mean to promise your wounded and dying child who is scared to death that they will not die? Hmm. And then a moment later, be the last one they caress in this lifetime. And to know that their death 
was of our own doing so that we could live? I think this question for me always puts into perspective what really is at stake here, what truly is at stake. And it's the risking of sacred parenthood and the risking of the true love. And you write about this in a prayer that I hear you offer to us on page 116. The prayer that I hear is that my hope is that God in the Anthropocene, Einstein's beloved Alte, is as Bonifer pleaded, God found in what we do know, and in our strengths and power, not simply in their absence, but in our woeful ignorance. I'm hoping for a God that befits sapiens, taking full responsibility for what we know and do. Good night, Martin Thea. <laughs> yeah. When I read this, I read this as a prayer, a collection of prayers, and the single prayer of your life. Mm -hmm. And throughout this entire book, you show us that there is profound beauty in life as you continue to love. And as you grow deeper into love, you find even deeper pain, even deeper sorrow, mm -hmm. even deeper joy, and even deeper love. And you write throughout this book a remembrance and a recollection of that love. And it is through these allusions to land, to nature, to family, that allows us to collapse time and space and really feel your presence mm -hmm. next to us as we read. And I hear that the prayer and the hope that you leave for us is that we truly know what is at stake here. You got to live, from what I see in this book, a rich and overflowing life. And you want that for us. We want that for our planet too, but we find ourselves unable to live that right now. And as we prepare our hearts and our voices to hopefully live that rich overflowing life that you have enjoyed yourself as you leave for us in your prayer, I find that in this great moment of grief, it's very hard to turn to a source of hope. And the reason that prayer is so important for me is when I think of prayer, I think of the first prayer to ever be uttered. What was that great moment of desperation, desolation, and separation that we had forgotten the love from which we come? Mm -hmm. And also, when we called out to that God, who was that God to hear that prayer and respond, to call back? for us to imagine and remember love and give us the light so our bud can blossom and flower so greatly even before we did before. And you often write in the book about justice and light. And we currently live, in my view, a world where our light is dimming, where our love is dimming, where we live in despair and injustice. And it is through this renewal of the light to shine upon mm. us that allows our seed and its bud to grow. Yeah. And often I think when, we, when I think of action, we often think that we ourselves are the ones who are doing the action. But it's really from the love and the care from others that we receive that we can really see the light in us and the beauty of this rich and overflowing life. I think there's not much more that we need to do than to open the eye of the heart and see the care that we get from you, from our family, from our ancestors, that we can pass to future generations, and as we would hope that they do for us too. And you really highlight this throughout the book. So when I think of prayer, I think of hope, and I think of the sacred love and the love in sacred parenthood the one that Mary showed to Jesus when she held him, the one that the Buddha's mother had shown him before dying, the one that my adoptive family received in the blessing from my birth family in Mexico. Huh. 
-hmm. And then also, the love in the caress of your writing that you give to your grandchildren. You allow us to taste the love that you have for your grandchildren. And that love is deep and profound. Mm -hmm. In many scriptures, it's regarded as the highest form of love. And you will invite mm -hmm. us into that too. And I see this as an arc of a prayer that we continue to come back and continue to, rem to remember that first prayer and that true love that you cultivated and see in the beauty of this life. And the prayer breathes life because life is a prayer. And each breath is a prayer itself. It's the prayer that remembers the beauty of your life, the ancestors of future generations, and the beauty of love. And Rabbi Arthur Ocean Waskow calls this the interbreath of life. Yeah. It is the breath that came to being on Sinai. It's the breath of a very sacred text, the thunder perfect mind. And I see it as the breath that we all share together. And it's the breath inside the breath. And it's the breath that allows us to re recollect and remember the love that you give to us and the love that is us. So your letters imagine and remember what that love is, even in a great moment of despair. And I think of it as maybe the first prayer that you are asking us to hear. And I have heard this prayer throughout reading this. So in this climate crisis, devastation, catastrophe, apocalypse, extinction, you write a love letter to Earth so that it may be heard because we come from the earth. Our lands are our bodies, and our bodies are the land. And the earth is what keeps moving in this natural cycle for us to truly be part of this greater love. So I, I read this as you leaving to us your call, your first prayer, the prayer of your single life. And our generation has the chance to finally call back. But in this great time, again, of despair, injustice, and fleeting hope, as you note, you see the change of agribusiness, or change from agriculture to agribusiness. Yeah. And you see this dimming light. This work, as you have noted in the book, deepens the despair and the pain and the suffering as you continue to love. So how do you find balance between the grief and joy that are ultimately wrapped up in love? Mm. Whoa. Uh, I'm just going to sit with, with such lovely remarks. I actually, John, hadn't thought about the book as a prayer. And that opens up some dimensions. Um, I, I'm, I've said that it's a, mine is a tragic view of life, and that is a, the honesty about which you talk, especially about uh, your generation and <clears throat> uh, what it faces. Um, but there's, there's something about the fact that most human beings have lived on a spectrum that runs from hard to terrible. <laughs> and yet, they made love, celebrated, made music, danced, found meaning uh, in their lives. And it's really my, my uh, generation, or Nyla's growing up, grew up at a time that uh, shared with us um, benefits that most human beings have never experienced. So what do we have to learn from all those people for whom life was hard? And yet they said yes to life in spite of everything. I suspect it was love. Uh, 
that, that they uh, lived into and shared and felt and made and, um, and that, that that's what gave them grounds. Uh, <clears throat> um, people ask me oftentimes, why are you hopeful? And, and I, you know, took note um, of the fact that in one recent study, a majority of your generation said they felt they were doomed. And they, those who were contemplating being parents said, no, we're not going to bring child into this uh, world. I think that is the reality for an, <clears throat> lots of folks. Um, and that's why I say, you know, if, if most human beings have, to, have had to live with this kind of uh, despair about the future, uh, look to them to tell us how, how their ancestors made it through. Um, and that's why I mentioned indigenous peoples and African American peoples have been given apocalypse over and again. And yet, what ingenious cultures, magnificent cultures, were created by them out of that, by somehow saying yes to life in spite of everything. Um, Desmond, Desmond Tutu uh, says it very, very simply, and these are my, my grounds for hope. Um, <clears throat> goodness is stronger than evil. Life is stronger than death. Light is stronger than darkness. <clears throat> and love is stronger than hate. It's just the tipping point. Or as our pastor says in Santa Fe, we had 40 days of Lent, now we've got 50 days of Easter time. The tipping point is 10 days of Easter time over 40 days of Lent. Um, so I, and you know, all kinds of individuals will not uh, maintain that, be able to maintain hope through thick and thin. But it's a kind of confidence in the triumph of life there. And it may not be our lives. It may not be our life as a species. Every species dies. And that's true for Homo sapiens, too. And in fact, we're the only surviving line of 16 lines mm -hmm. of human species. So I want to. Um, face the kind of despair that you talk about and yet maintain this confidence in the triumph of life uh, in whatever form. And the, the, you know, the, unlike so much uh, religious faith, the players here are not God and human beings. The players are God and creation and the triumph of life and creation. So. We belong to the journey of the universe, which began far earlier than our <clears throat> human life did and which will be going on long after human life has not. Our, our, our moment is seven one hundredths of an inch in Earth's timeline so far. <laughs> no, for, let's not make ourselves the center of it all, magnificent as we are. Uh, we showed up very late for work, uh, and we'll be leaving early. The, our, our, our microbes will long outlive us. Um, so thank you for the comments um, that this book is a prayer. I'd never thought about it in that way. I did think about what I wrote to Eduardo in the first letter about being lost in wonder. And 
uh, from the Greek, understanding that the word cosmos is the word for both order and beauty. So embrace beauty as its own resistance to disorder <laughs> and chaos. And your, your comments, John, about love, I mean, the, the gospel, the epistle of John, uh, puts it pretty simply, God first love us, our, our response is love, is a responding love, and not only an initiating. It's initiating on some fronts, but it's in response to the love of what Rabbi Nahum, Lord Lev, uh, calls simply living presence. Mm -hmm. Living presence that hovers over all of the universe, and we belong to that universe. Um, that's enough. Thank you, John, for articulating what I think we're all feeling, that these are prayers. And Larry, I feel like um, all I can offer in this moment are my tears huh. of gratitude, of remembrance, of the invitation to be overwhelmed. and of being taught over and over by you. Mm -hmm. um, when you spoke about the toll is greater, not less, especially when your calling is loving the world, I think we don't cry enough. <laughs> and that's the gift you've given me today. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think the grief we feel, the overwhelming responsibility, um, what we are seeing, how to hold all that and why, mm -hmm. but to release it together as rain. Um, our students, we talk a lot about grief and love, but I think what I've realized today, today is do we have the courage to cry together? Mm -hmm. And that's what um, the gift you've given me here. And that in itself is a, is a cairn that you talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite letters is when you, you wrote it on February 26, 2021. And you speak of, quote, essential elements needed to thrive in the Anthropocene. You say to your grandsons, we'll build cairns. Cairns are small stone towers that serve as points of reference where the trail does not yet exist or is easily lost. And I think, you know, in the desert, we would be lost without the cairns that have been built and left by others. And I feel like that's what your letters really are. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to the cairns that were built for you, um, that you followed as a graduate student at Union, and where that has brought you today. Yeah. Well, thank you, Terry, on all, on all counts. Um, your mentioning of cairns uh, reminds me that <clears throat> I wrote that there are four of them at the trailhead. Mourn, mourning, grieving, organizing, blessed are the organized, and healing. You know, and that uh, you can't 
put cairns in your backpack. <laughs> you can't load them up in your backpack. So those you have to have to remember and re return to mourning, grieving, organizing, and healing as <clears throat> the trails at the trailhead, and then make your make your way from from there. Not like not having thought about this book as a prayer, I hadn't thought about my life in terms of Karen's either. And um, they would have been uh, Karen's that others built, and that as a child and youth, uh, and then the time that Nyla and I have had together, which will be 59 years in July, um, most of those Cairns, I don't, I'd have to think about what they were and who, who built them mm -hmm. and how, I, how they pointed out the way that I should go. <clears throat> so one reason I wrote the letters is that I never asked my grandparents about their lives. Mm -hmm. I, I had wonderful relationship to all four of my grandparents. We lived in the same small village. But three of them were immigrants. I can't tell you what lives they lived before we kids came along, because we were only <laughs> thinking of ourselves as, as uh, kids and whether Grandma Rasmussen would have any chocolate chip cookies or not if we went to her house. Um, so I, I just don't quite know how to answer your question. Uh, I do know that those years at Union, and I was a student there in the, in the last half of the 1960s, and the 1960s were formative for all of us uh, at that time. But I got involved in things in, in <clears throat> where we thought something terribly important was at stake and we must do something about it. Um, this was civil rights movement. This was anti-Vietnam uh, war. Um, and, a, and a dozen students said, Chemical Bank, where Union has its money and most of the students have our money, is giving loans to the apartheid government of South Africa. We'll show them. We'll take out our bank accounts and we'll put them in Freedom National Bank down on 125th Street in, in Harlem, uh, an institution of the civil rights movement itself. <laughs> but the notion, and I've, I've said, and I don't know if it's in the, one of the letters or not, Nilo's account and mine uh, never made three figures to the left <laughs> of, of the decimal point, you know, <laughs> that, that Chemical Bank was going to buckle under because <laughs> <laughs> Union students' bank accounts were being transferred out of there uh, was ludicrous, but to us it was it was the right thing to do, and maybe it would make a difference. And Union Seminary did take out all of its money from Chemical Bank and uh, and put it <laughs> down the bottom of the hill. So I think uh, that's a, th that participation in something that was bigger than us, with people uh, both in there and halfway around the world in South Africa, um, was, was for me, um, I don't know if I would call it a cairn, but it was, it certainly marked a pathway to, to walk. And when Nelson Mandela came back and at Riverside Church, where we also were present when Dr. King came and gave his famous speech on the time to break silence about the Vietnam War. Um, but when Nelson Mandela came back and said thanks, uh, you know, we all felt that we were part of that drama. Um, so, there are, the, there are these moments, they may not always be big ones, they might be small ones. It might be a late night conversation with you know, one of your, your colleagues. I remember from, uh, Union Seminary, people came because of the faculty 
But the most important conversations were not with faculty members. They were with each other in the, in the, wee, in the wee hours oftentimes. So it's, it's only kind of retrospectively that I could identify uh, the cairns. Um, that notion of a cairn actually comes from the passion narrative in Luke, where Jesus says, um, <clears throat> these stones will cry out, <laughs> you know, if you don't bear witness. Mm -hmm. And the stones are the, are the cairns. Mm -hmm. They don't make the path. You've got to do that. We've got to do that. Mm -hmm. But they show where the path might, might go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now the boys and the other grandkids will be the ones building cairns and, I hope, noticing the cairns that others have put there for them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Incidentally, um, uh, I think this, this question of weeping together and finding joy together is so important. I mean, I'm not one as a social ethicist who's ever done nearly enough in understanding the psychology of being assaulted as we are now and as future generations will be. I just have to spend much more time uh, with that. But I'm pretty sure Martin Luther is right. I didn't put this in the book because some language of Luther is unfit for children. Um, he says, from a depressed ass can come no happy fart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> why we love Larry. <laughs> Seriously. From the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's also pretty important. I mean, if right. slipping into a depression, which, you know, happens all the time and easily, more easily in our time, has to have antidotes. And That's it's, it's beauty. And from a depressed from a ass. depressed ass can come no happy fart. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, let's open up to questions. <laughs> we have a few minutes, so please, uh, any, any questions for, for Larry that you'd like to raise, please. We've got a few minutes, let's use them well. I was just, uh, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for your beautiful book and for the comments and the beautiful introduction and forward and John, your very heartfelt um, insights and uh, very moving with your questioning. Um, I'm curious because you mention um, I guess light and beauty so much and love and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that in terms of um, healing. Mm. Yeah, all these questions are questions I haven't thought about, um, but have probably written about just by virtue of what I wanted to say to the grandkids. Um, My inclination as a prof was always to give a, a rigorous rational analysis of in, in social ethics, whatever the social issues were that we were uh, attending to. And like I said, while I, I think that's indispensable, uh, it doesn't. Um, rational analysis doesn't nurture and strengthen what is most important, and those are relationships. And I hope in the book I've been clear that the relationships are among us as, as human uh, beings, but it's really the whole uh, 
created order. And that last letter on it's all in the pronouns is from Robin Wall Kimmerer and Braiding Sweetgrass. She said when she came to Santa Fe, the word it is the most insidious word in the English language, <laughs> making everything it. And <laughs> so she wants it to be <coughs> I and we, um, and not you and they, as it's. Uh, the dehumanizing of the word it, making things, and she goes on to say, that most indigenous language are verb languages, and English is really good at being a noun language where the noun is an object, and we as subject act on the object rather than subject to subject. Interaction, mutuality, reciprocity. Um, and that's, that's what I'm trying to get at by saying what's key here is relationships, because relationships that are healthy relationships are, are uh, reciprocal, interactive, subject to subject uh, relationships. But I didn't really answer your question as to what the particulars there on light and uh, love. I noted, Terry, that in your piece in the New York Times on the Great Salt Lake, at the end of that piece, you talk about mobilizing love. I, I'm one of those people who, uh, due to the influence of Reinhold Niebuhr, never did talk much about love. Um, and it was because love was a sentimentality that didn't bring justice. And we were all focused on justice. And love for Niebuhr was a contrast. It was a personal thing and it was always sentimentalized and romanticized and didn't make structural and systemic changes. But you want to do systemic change through the uh, mobilization of love. And I do too now, and one of the gifts of writing to your own uh, grandsons is to understand what I, what I would now call prophetic love, which is uh, love aimed at structural and systemic transformations. Uh, and uh, there isn't a whole lot of sentimentality about this a lot of times. <laughs> so it it, uh, I mean, uh, Margaret Farley calls it just love mm -hmm. or justice love. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the same thing about kind of light and the other words that you use there. They're relational terms where we have to mobilize what they mean for systemic change. Thank you for the question, and thank you for uh, this remarkable conversation. Um, I just want to say, as someone who knows you and knew <laughs> you, you may not have talked about love, but you lived love yeah. very profoundly, exuded love, always driven by love. <laughs> and that was very clear to all of us who had the yeah. incredible good fortune to call you our teacher. Yeah. And you continue to do so today. So yeah. can we thank Larry? Oh, thank you. You know that if I, if I had the means, I'd hire all of you as my agents here. This is something <laughs> a beautiful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sponsor, Religion and Public Life. Copyright 2023. President and Fellows of Harvard College.